importance of intersectionality and its links with the Earth Charter. So there will be a um, recorded version of this webinar, but maybe in the meantime, so that everyone join, I can just shortly introduce a bit about myself and then we will begin. Um, so my name is Emma, I'm 20 years old, I'm studying in France and I drive my life towards learning more about uh, sustainability and climate justice and systems of oppression. And I, I'm involved in different uh, climate, on, climate justice and environmental youth organizations here in France. And on that, uh, in this journey, I crossed the path of Earth Charter International, um, which is definitely working on these fights uh, by promoting the spirit of the Earth Charter. So yeah, and as it is not about me, uh, we are going to start the webinar. So to open the webinar, uh, I wanted to organize a discussion on intersectionality to uh, raise awareness on like the interconnectedness of environmental and social fights um, and the importance to question the common systems behind them. Um, I think it definitely links up with the work done by Earth Charter International uh, concerning when it promotes uh, like system thinking uh, or an education for sustainable development that values a more holistic uh, spirituality, if I can say so. And um, so, yeah. Uh, and with that in mind, I wanted to give the space to young, inspiring voices uh, that already advocate for that paradigm. Um, and in no particular order, just because I see you in this order on my screen, maybe you could give us a few elements about yourself and what you are doing. So yeah, Marie, if you want to start. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you, Emma, for the opportunity and the space. Um, my name is Marie. I'm originally from Costa Rica, but I've been living in the Netherlands for four years. Uh, I'm a media and information student, and I am really interested in everything regarding uh, social and climate justice. So um, it was very interesting when Emma told me about this webinar because intersectionality, I think, is at the core of uh, the things that we really need to uh, take into consideration for these movements to really be uh, helpful for everyone and not for a specific uh, group of people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Krista, you want to go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Krista. I am based in the US in Los Angeles. Um, I kind of took a non-traditional path, I'd say. I actually um, started becoming more interested in sustainability because I used to be a fashion designer. And when I was a fashion designer, I um, learned a lot about how toxic and exploitive it was. And so soon after I took like a few work trips to China and saw the conditions, I basically started transitioning out of working in the industry and transitioning into a more sustainable career path. Um, and so that's kind of how I ended up here. Um, I, I still kind of work a full-time job because I'm still trying to fully transition out, um, but I don't design apparel anymore, but I do a lot of work for the company I work for around sustainability, um, just as like a side volunteer thing. And then I run a community organization um, that I guess post and pre and post COVID will host um, really small and intimate events and discussions around intersectionality and um, climate justice and social justice. Oh, thanks. Thank you a lot. Um, Ariel, I have you next. Hi, so I'm also from Los Angeles. Um, I have an online Instagram platform at Go Green Save Green. I'll put it in the chat right now. Um, but basically, a couple years ago, I started becoming really curious about um, 
the climate crisis and like everything that it entailed you know I like many other people kind of got into it like my introduction was probably like recycling and straws and then I started doing research and realizing it was like way 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 more than that so the past three years I've had this platform where basically I research everything under the sun that you can imagine um, so that includes fast fashion that includes veganism that includes intersectionality um like environmental science, how mycelium works, tree planting scams, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So I talk about a lot of different um, subjects. I don't talk about any one thing. And I really love like um, getting people that are like, uh, you know, knowledgeable in their niche and then using my platform to amplify the knowledge that they have. Um, and yeah, basically that's, that's kind of what I do is I just share information that I find online. Yeah, questioning everything is like <laughs> the basis of everything we do. Uh, and Mitzi, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. So I am Mitzi Janelle Tan, a climate justice activist based in Metro Manila, Philippines. I am the co-founder of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is basically the Fridays for Future of the Philippines, which is basically the youth climate strike um, group here. I first became an activist in 2017 and I was able to integrate with indigenous leaders of our land and they told us about how they were being displaced, harassed and militarized. And that's when I realized that I had to join the fight um, for a better future and a better planet that it is a collective systemic fight that we need to join. Thank you so much. This is interesting to see like how we have all different Path, but we end up at the same place <laughs> like that. Um, so we are now going to begin our discussion and dive a bit more into like the concept and the importance of intersectionality. And um, yeah, for all of you watching, you will have a time at the end to ask your question. So you can either type them as it goes in the chat or you can, you will be able to like open your microphones or type in the chat after that. So yeah. Um, I wanted to start with intersectionality by giving a short uh, definition. And so you will be free to comment on that and um, yeah, give us your experience with the concept and like how you implement that as your, in your life as activists and as citizens <laughs> as well. So intersectionality is a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, it was coined in the, at the end of the 80s. And it considers all the factors of oppression uh, that oppress um, individuals and communities in combination rather than in isolation. So basically, it uh, uh, it explains how people how different people experience life differently. And I wanted to know if you had like anything to add to this definition. Uh, why do you consider it detrimental to? treat as separate like climate justice and racial justice, health justice. Um, so yeah, I'm happy for anyone to comment on that if someone wants to start. Um, yeah, I'll start. I think it's really important to look at environmental justice through the lens of intersectionality, which in this instance, I think um, we can definitely think about gender, environmental issues disproportionately impact women. Um, secondly, like where you're located in the world. So um, this can mean a lot of different things. So for one example of it is like women in like the global South are gonna experience it much differently than like women who live in, you know, beaten down neighborhoods, but like say in a really rich country like the UK, Europe, United States, anything like that. Um, both groups of women are being impacted like more intensely than say other groups, but the ways that uh, their experiences are like not the same. And I think, um, you know, where I live is like a really good example. Um, I live just south of downtown Los Angeles and maybe like two blocks from where I live, there's like these giant like warehouse factories that are just like across the street from people's homes. Like you just open the door and it's right there. Um, but if you drive maybe like 30 miles either direction, like west or east, um, people could not imagine like just opening the door and like there'd be a factory there. You know, I live right next to a super, super industrial city named Vernon. And I think there's only like a hundred residents in that city because it's all, all just like warehouses. And like, uh, I think it's the only, I don't remember what the term is, cor corporatized city in America. Um, but 
yeah basically the air quality is so bad like I drive through there and like I have to turn off my AC because like the air you could just smell like all the chemicals you know and so people who with like an intersection um of like their income level plus like uh where they're working you know all those things those kind of go into like their experiences because somebody working and living in a much nicer high-end area is never going to have to really face those realities that somebody with like those uh facets of their identity might have to and that's not to say that people that are like women that are from the global south cannot do better for themselves but it's just to say like looking at patterns like what are the majority of them experiencing you know how can we look at and how can we best support you know people that fit into like cer certain uh, demographics and if I could just add to that it's it's really an overlap and a combination of all these issues and we cannot tackle any one of these issues in a vacuum because they are all they all amplify and are amplified by each other the climate crisis um, and then race class gender all of this combined together and if we tackle if we try to tackle any of what one of them in a vacuum will end up leaving people behind and that's why it's so important to recognize how these issues overlap otherwise if we have a climate activism that doesn't talk about class or race or gender we'll end up leaving the people most impacted behind um, and that's why it's so important to make sure that we don't talk about the climate crisis just as an environmental issue, but really at its core, a systemic issue that impacts people. And these are these people are impacted by different socioeconomic issues that are already existing today. Um, as Ariel said, um, women, especially, especially women of color, especially women of color in um, marginalized, economically marginalized areas and culturally marginalized areas also. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like more and more a paradigm to integrate because it tackles issues that I feel are more and more um, coming out, if that makes sense. Like only with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw how communities and individuals that were already on the margin were the most impacted. And it's the same with climate change and everything. So yeah, Krista, would you want us, would you, would you want to share like how you integrate that in your vision as an activist and what did it change for you? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll also say um, that like I've been really pondering this, this idea of like what it really means to consider like environmentalism in terms of physical space and mental space. Like, um, you know, like, if people don't have safe space within our minds, like how does that affect them physically, right? And I've been thinking about it so much within the context of the US and all of the violence that's happening towards the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, because I'm like, it's crazy how strong our mentality can be to the point where it's affecting like people all over the world, right? So this, this person or these people who are committing these hate crimes they don't hold safe space for asian americans in their minds and so now asian americans are physically being harmed right and so i've been thinking so much about how we really need to like open our minds and um and like tackle those things in our minds to like create proper and safe environments for the people around us um you know, even the same thing with people who belong to like LGBTQIA plus or queer communities. Um, like, you know, I've had to do so much work just for myself to understand what that means. And there are so many different areas in which we have to do that work, right? Um, and so I think for me, it's affected me because it, it's made me question, like ask more questions just to the people around me um and really encourage deeper conversations um i think for my platform like that's like really what i'm trying to do um because you know i get overwhelmed overwhelmed a little bit by like the big stuff um and i i tend to get a lot of climate anxiety too so um for me i take the small steps um to kind of just opening the floor um 
to conversation and empathy and like seeking wisdom through other people. Thanks. Yeah, we will definitely talk a bit more about climate anxiety after that. Marie, I don't want to offer. Oh, can you like share your experience with intersectionality and how do you define the concept in your life? Yeah, uh, for me, when I first encountered this um, uh, this term, I started questioning of, especially first with academia, because I encountered it in an academic context. So I started thinking of the, the authors that we were reading for my classes. Um, and just that when I switched that little uh, thing in my brain regarding academia, I started realizing like, oh, wow, we really just read a specific um, group of people. And then what about the rest? So when I started looking at intersectionality within academia, I started also like um, Krista was saying, this little things uh, within ourselves that we have to start questioning, but the only way to do so is to be exposed to new perspectives, which becomes really hard when we are um, in spaces that are so uh, not controlled, but so specifically created and that have been this way for so long that I think if we don't question ourselves and we don't have this open mind of thinking, okay, maybe I've been always listening to this one perspective. What if I include all of this other 30 perspectives, let's say, that already will change a lot. So I think for me, it has been this small process as well of including it in my day-to-day -day life and through it questioning so many things that I've learned and that I've, I'm, I'm told. And this goes on every level of of, of my life, even in my personal life or academic life, like I said, um, and then how it reflects onto my activism and the, the type of activism that I also want to be involved with. Um, so I think for me that has been the biggest struggle, <laughs> the, the more like personal, um, but once you, you as like an individual understand its importance and how it, it's crucial for it to be present, then I think it gets a bit easier to start a bit with the micro level and then little by little implement it on more aspects of your lives. Um, so yeah, that for me has been the main ways in which it's present in my life, but it's it has been yeah a lot of questioning everything that I've been told from different places. So I think, yeah, it's very important. Uh, to have an open mind and to create these safe spaces, like Krista was saying, like I really like that you said that in our brains in order to also provide these safe spaces for others. Yeah, I'm happy to hear your girls say that it is a lot about questioning yourself and things out here, because I think that it is something that everyone can do at its own uh, rhythm like you can start anywhere you want depending on your interest and then it's just like uh, a chain um and i wanted to have your opinion on because in france uh, intersectionality is something that is for some um negatively seen because they say it um it is a, a, a bit like a separatism because it um it shows how do you how would I say from that like uh, identity aspects uh, as uh, as individuals like yeah I identify as this community or as this gender or I do think this thing and so a lot of people say that it separates people more that they, it brings that them together so yeah, I wanted to have I'm happy for anyone to comment on that yeah I Oh, I don't know, <laughs> all of us, but uh, if I can go, uh, I think that it, um, it's important to understand that framing is, is it's important. Sometimes these separations are, are quite important to understand how these uh, can also intersect and overlap within a group of people. And um, although it, it, I don't see it personally as a separatism at all, it's about understanding the components of a situation or like this 
uh, things that we have to take into consideration in order to create a, a more empathetic and safer, uh, like complete and whole uh, system. So I think that this framing within it's important, but it's, it's not necessarily to separate um, in like a negative way, but it's about creating awareness about how these different frames have a have an impact and like how be being part of different minorities will affect you in different ways. Um, like Kimberly Crenshaw, which is the uh, person that we were talking about, she discusses like um, that a black woman is, she's a woman and she's black. And because she's a black woman, she will experience uh, uh, things differently than a white woman. So sometimes it is important to create these frames within uh, within it, but not necessarily to separate, but to create more understanding about it. And just to add, it's it's true. We're all oppressed and exploited by the same system and group of people. It is that 1%, usually the face of a white man. But if we don't recognize the different levels of privilege that we have, we will end up forgetting the people who are already most marginalized. I've, I've seen so many my country, the Philippines, is a neo-colony, which means we are, although technically the independent, we are still very in heavily influenced by um, global North countries in terms of politics, economics, and culture. And because of neoliberal policies, we'll end up seeing our farmers being displaced for solar farms. We're seeing our indigenous peoples being pushed out of their lands to build um, hydroelectric dams. We're seeing um, small fishing communities lose their livelihood for the sake of environmental rehabilitation. So if our climate activism or anything in our lives, if our activism doesn't include the people most marginalized, who also are the ones who are resisting the system the most and who have the greatest stories of resistance, we will end up sacrificing them and then we will be no different from the system that we are today that only focuses on the development for a few. And so we have to draw these lines, not to separate us, but to make sure that we uplift the people who are most marginalized. That's what activism is about, decentering yourself and centering other people, centering the ones most marginalized, because otherwise we will for sure end up for leaving them behind. Yeah, I um, to touch back on kind of what Marie was talking about. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, looking at environmental issues and humanitarian issues through like an intersectional lens is very important and it does help us be able to not only identify like patterns but then like how can we help these groups of people you know going to them and like then we know like who to talk to or what people are suffering from like what problems and how can we address those problems um effectively and I think you know it's uh only if you're using like that information to pit people against one another I think then it could be like separatist but if you're just looking at it to be like okay this is what this this group of people needs is what that group of people needs then like you're not necessarily pitting them you're not saying that one is suffering from worse issues than the other um like in a in like a comp competitive way like you can say like this is very urgent and this group of people needs help urgently um but like not necessarily invalidating other groups of people. And I think, you know, anytime that someone is like, well, I thought that, you know, all people matter or whatever, like, yeah, no, that is true. But like, we have to look at like, who needs immediate help? And what are the things that we can tackle at this moment? What are the things that, you know, we can just like decide to fix and like, we can actually do something about it, you know? Yeah, and I think I feel that if you are thinking that um, you are going to win the, let's say, the climate battle uh, without an intersectional lens, in fact, you will stay like at the surface because the deeper roots are linked with what oppresses the people as well, which is what you all uh, mentioned. So, yeah, and even though I feel we kind of uh, already we started to talk a bit about that in fact, but I wanted to link that with education. And um, what do you think should be the role of education in spreading that, uh, that lens, that paradigm 
And uh, with that in mind, what do you think are some of the insufficiencies of current educational systems? So these are like questions we could talk about during hours, but yeah, I'm, if anyone wants to. I think, yeah, I think definitely like what intersections is, you know, is definitely a big one. You know, we learn a lot about like, you know, I think, I think like when you're that young of age, it's easier for you to, like you're not as like molded into your ideas, right? And I think intersectionality taught at a young age can also lead to like more empathy, more understanding as to like, oh, how other groups might be living, you know, you're looking at your peers and you might realize like when you're kids, you, you sometimes understand that you're different from your classmates, but you don't always understand why. So being able to give children the tools to understand like, maybe some of the living conditions of like their peers and um, how that could be like out of their reach, you know, like talking about these things instead of just like acting like all the 30 kids in a classroom, um, you know, are coming from like the same background or whatever, you know, we all know of like someone that, you know, or groups of people that were just like different from us. So I think definitely just continuous, uh, discussion of like what intersectionality is and different ways that it can be applied, not just in like a human way, but in a science way. So like um, how Mitzi was talking about, you know, the intersections of like uh, green energy and like displacement of peoples, you know, the intersection, the just understanding that uh, nothing is truly isolated, that everything does have like a ripple effect and, you know, emphasizing that point throughout our education through science, through like humanities, um, through history, all that kind of good stuff. And it's so important to not just have education in terms of formal education, but one of the most important forms of education is talking to people, especially again, the voices of the most marginalized. A lot of our activism here in the Philippines involves, well, before the pandemic, um, going to communities and learning from them. Um, during the pandemic, we've still been able to do that, but it's a lot more limited, of course, for the safety of everyone. But it's really going to these communities and learning from them firsthand how they defend the environment, how they're seeing the environment change, and also having that exchange of information and education with each other. Everything should be that flow of discussion and not this top-down thing. And the way our education system is now is always going to be not what we need to topple down this system because the education system is part of the system. And so we always have to remember that we also have to go beyond what we're learning in school. And while at the same time still pushing um, things in school, because for example, um, climate curriculum here is so Western and technical and foreign and alienating. It doesn't tell us about how we're already experiencing the typhoons firsthand. It just talks about melting ice caps and polar bears. And it's, it feels so distant to a country that's already feeling the climate crisis. And that's, there's something wrong there. And then there's also how a lot of um, the, the science and the knowledge is so inaccessible because language barrier is such a big thing also. Um, even when translating these complicated science English terms into Filipino or Tagalog, it's still so difficult to understand. And then there's how, you know, like the way the US Philippine war was written, it's only two pages, even, the, and then you have the Japanese and Spanish Philippine war having like such long pages, but then the US Philippine war was a lot more destructive than the other two. But you really see how the education system is shaped and formed by the people in power. And so they're not gonna put in the education system how to change that, how to topple that, how to get rid of them. And so we have to go out of our education systems in school and really go to panels like these, go to places where we can have that education that teaches you, that, that talks about changing the system. Yeah, I think, um, I think bumping off of both um, Ariel and Mitzi, like in terms of like formal education, like, for me, it's like so much about like normalizing, like teaching and talking about real history, right? Like in, in America specifically, like we don't talk about the real history of America like at all. 
And if we did, our education like curriculum would be far more intersectional because we'd be talking about native people, we'd be talking about Asian Americans, we'd be talking about African Americans, we'd be talking about Latinx people, you know, um, we'd be talking about like Irish immigrants, we'd be talking about all of those things instead of just slapping a white label over everything. And um, I think that's really important. And we're like so far from getting to that point because to Mitzi's point, you know, like it, it is those powers that are controlling like our educational systems. Um, and I think in terms of like informal education, you know, like education comes to us in so many different forms today. Like it's not just happening in schools, it's happening on Instagram, it's happening at work, it's happening at churches and, and all of those things. And I think it's so important to diversify those spaces. Um, and it's hard because, you know, regionally, like especially in America, like certain regions are just very not diverse. <laughs> um, and so that's why you have all these people who are craving diversity, like flocking to cities, but then the diversity is leaving those areas. Um, but, you know, I think it's so important to diversify like formal and informal spaces of education and not just in terms of color, but also just diversifying like thought, <laughs> you know, just like the way that people think is so important. Yeah, I think because um, one of you mentioned also, that I, yeah, it was Mitzi, that the accessibility to a lot of this information is really hard when you don't speak English because most of the information is in English. So I think that is also something that personally, it it's something that I want to do something about especially for Latin America because it's a region that is really affected by climate change but there's not really access to a lot of information so creating spaces where this information becomes accessible but not in a language that is um, you know makes you feel alienated and that you don't really understand you don't connect with these terms with this examples that they give you, but instead that they take into consideration also the living experiences of the specific area that um, this information is being brought to. So I think um, one of the main aspects, yeah, definitely it's to diversify um, education, both formal and informal, but also it's about the importance of bottom up approaches, I think, um, and how great they are actually and how much they can do um for the social movements because if we are not getting all of this information of course not from the formal education system it's still great that we can acquire it from other places and all of these bottom-up approaches that are uh surfacing a lot with social media i think are so important because we are mostly on social media every day you know it's something that we consume a lot so I think it's so important to have these spaces on social media where it's about um, teaching from a place of empathy and really trying to get information everywhere. So I think it's it's very important. I am working with a group of Costa Ricans actually um, on, on a platform for this, where we want to provide um, education regarding climate and so social justice in Spanish so that it's it's more accessible and it's possible for people to uh, relate more and it's not this western uh, very distant uh, idea of what sustainability is like and that takes into consideration that a lot of the time being sustainable um, has to do a lot with privilege let's say um, especially like economic privilege so it's about understanding that and not telling people like, oh, you're doing this wrong because you're not completely vegan when we have to understand that it's not possible for everyone. So I think it's including this diversity in every aspect and on every level that will truly give us a very satisfying outcome in the long run. But yeah, I think definitely has to be approached from bottom up like it has been, especially in the last year, a lot of, of new things have surfaced. So I think that's that's great that we as a community, like a, 
universal community are trying to bring this for each other. Yeah, and I was thinking that uh, when you look at like the practice of uh, formal education, there are so much, so many like great initiatives by teachers to try to um, teach differently and from a different place. Uh, while when you are looking at like the the system, the bigger picture, you see how you all tell that um, yeah, that it is uh, coined for the current uh, capitalist system in the sense that it prepares the kids for like getting a job rather than just learning about uh, society and others and themselves. And I think it really, yeah, it really shows in the way that uh, the, the educational system is organized by like separating all the different topics, whereas in the reality of our lives, they are all related. And especially when you are fighting for climate, racial, health justice, and so on. And yeah, I don't know. Do you have in mind like an, uh, an educational um, experience that you lived that uh, helped you? I, yeah, I like me did all about the meeting uh, some indigenous communities and learning from them. So do you have, do you have a, like a, a similar experience that told you? I haven't, I think a lot of my learning has definitely been online and not through formal like education spaces. So when I am learning from those communities, it's usually either through Instagram, Twitter or Clubhouse where I can like hear from them directly because it's not something that I've typically found that like either like mainstream media talks about or like things that you would find necessarily in a textbook or college class or anything like that. Um, I also didn't go to school for environmental issues. So um, I have my degree in something else. So maybe it was talked about and I was just taking like the wrong classes. Um, but yeah, uh, learn from the people directly through Clubhouse, Twitter, or Instagram. Yeah, I think it's mostly through this uh, encounters with people that we learn so much. So I, I, I insist on this, uh, the importance of this safe spaces, both online and offline, where you can meet with people and you can um, get different perspectives, because honestly, that's the only way that you can question what you've been taught when you fully get um, exposed to this new perspectives and you start realizing, okay, everything I've learned doesn't have to be in these two categories. There can be so many other categories as well. So I think it's, it's very important to connect with other people. I think experiences like this are so important because um, now that we have the chance to do it online, it has really um, opened the door to so many opportunities to connect with people all over the world. So I think that uh, the fact that we are taking uh, this and using it uh, in a very positive way, it's, it's really great. And also um, opportunities like the Earth Charter that uh, they have some courses that they can, um, they really open um, your mind to new perspectives and there's people from everywhere. And it's such a, a nice and fulfilling experience because uh, yeah, I think it's it's very wonderful to open our brains and like our minds to all of these new perspectives and people also that have a, had a really different uh, upbring, upbringing and background, but we still uh, share this this need to to do something to to not stay quiet to you know to keep fighting. So I think it's it's very wonderful to to have these spaces where we're able to do so. Yeah, definitely. I like that as well, like meeting people from communities, but also from different places that can make the thing, okay, yeah, I didn't see it like that. And now I can like start to think about that. And yeah. And as we begin to talk about uh, empathy and compassion, 
Uh, there's the last topic I wanted to hear you on, which is climate anxiety or eco-anxiety. So I think that a lot of us in the panel, but also in the audience and the people that we watch after that have experienced. So it's a source of stress um, that comes from like learning about uh, and watching the, the impacts of climate change and worrying about the future generations and feeling like we can't make a sufficient difference in uh, stopping that. So I wanted to know what is your experience uh, with that and like, do you have any tip, uh, if I can say so, or at least to prevent um, that from keeping us to take action? Honestly, I find that like the best way that I was able to overcome it was by starting my platform and like educating people. Um, I was more focused on not on like educating people about things that I knew that weren't as popular. So when I started my platform back in 2018, there was like a lot of zero wasters. So I didn't feel as though the page needed another zero waste page to me. Um, I was looking more for like the impacts of everything that I was using. So um, I started having a lot of climate anxiety because I had roommates and I was trying to be more eco-friendly, but they weren't. And even in the apartment, I was like, I feel like I can't really see a difference in like the trash that we're putting out. Um, so I started looking up things like the environmental impact of my toothbrush and then sharing that <laughs> my lighter. And like, for me, it really started with, okay, how can people understand this in like a tangible way? And like, maybe you don't understand how like, when you make printer ink, how VCOs are impacting the atmosphere, but you can understand how like over the course of your lifetime, you've used, you know, a bunch of toothbrushes. And then you can imagine like all the people that you know have been using a bunch of toothbrushes. And like, that's something that's a little bit easier to understand. So I always thought that sharing information and actionable information also is really useful because if everybody is aware, but no one has any like practical skills or steps or resources to do anything we're basically creating like the bystander effect so to me like raising awareness wasn't enough I also wanted to share ways that like people were able to participate um no matter how much like money you had and like just um understanding that you can do something as small as like uh get a gardening or something like that like it doesn't have to it doesn't have to always be like starting an organization or taking on like an oil executive or in you know in like a courtroom battle like these things can be small and like and you know I on my page I thought it was something that really helped me was like you know in the example of the guerrilla gardening um understanding like your native plants where you live and understanding that you can help those ecosystems and all understanding that all you have to do is order seeds which are like not that expensive um and then like teaching people this is how you make them and this is the value that like native plants bring to your area and this is why you know um exotic plants or invasive plants are bad like to me that really helps because i would imagine like okay people are sharing that and now like i have helped put a little bit more like goodness in the world <laughs> Yeah, Krista, you, oh yeah, on me too, yeah, go on, please. I guess when talking about climate anxiety, it's so important to also talk about climate trauma um, because so often when you look up climate anxiety and you look it up online, you'll see this white person afraid of the future, but the climate crisis isn't just something for the future, it's something that's happening today and climate trauma isn't talked about enough. In countries like the Philippines where there is not enough awareness about the climate crisis and then there's a mental health taboo and stigma and then um, climate science and the empowering type of climate education is also inaccessible. So many people feel powerless um, and that's what we have to remember. We always have to talk about climate trauma and climate anxiety and how these two come together. Climate trauma is, is you know, from the term it's it's trauma from past experiences of the climate crisis um, and that's exacerbated by your knowledge of the climate crisis going at a full speed rate at, at this point and countries like the Philippines being the ones who are most impacted by the climate crisis and knowing that we will be the ones who are hit the hardest. Um, and so it's so important to talk about these things and, and mental health in general, to talk about these things with your friends, with the, with the community. And 
sometimes just letting yourself grieve. There is something to grieve. There is something to be anxious about, and that's acceptable. So you have to let yourself feel those feelings, but then also remember that you aren't alone in feeling those feelings. You aren't alone in this fight. We are, again, only joining the fight of environmental defenders who are already so strong. And then you remember that you're also not alone in your country and your country isn't alone. Literally in this meeting, there are people from across the world. And when you think of that, you think that there is someone in every continent and every country, maybe even fighting for the same thing for you are fighting for a better world. It, it kind of gives you this sense of victory how can we lose when there's so many of us fighting for climate justice how can we lose when we're fighting for the right thing the youth have always been this revolutionary generation leading the way in almost every historical movement to defeat the oppressors alongside the most marginalized sectors of society and so this is only the latest wave of revolutions and if anyone can do the impossible it's us and it's for me it's always remembering that and and the Philippines is also a very dangerous place for activists. We are often seen as terrorists. We're the second most dangerous country in the world for environmental defenders and activists. Um, something I'm sure people from Costa Rica understand because Latin America is the most dangerous region for defenders. And so it is very scary. Aside from climate anxiety, there's also climate activism anxiety or activism anxiety in general that come together. But a lot of my activism no longer stems from anger or fear or sadness, which are very valid, but it, it now comes from a place of love, love for the people and love for humanity and love for the planet. And that's what pushes me forward because my love will always be greater than my fear. I love that. Thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to add that um, for climate anxiety, like when, when we get climate anxiety, I think it's like when we when we learn so much about sustainability or social issues and injustices that are happening around the world, you know, we have more visibility than we've ever had into those types of things. And so it's easy to like get compassion fatigue and, and anxiety and all of those things. And I think we tend to lose our practicality and so I think it's always like really important to like ground yourself, you know, like Mitzi mentioned, you know, like it is okay to have those feelings. You should talk about those feelings, you know, process, but don't forget to release and then act. Um, and, um, you know, when, when you start to act, like all you have to do is say like, what can, ask yourself, like, what can I do right now? Even if it's small, um, you know, I, I was listening to something that talked about like this idea of the silence of science and it talks about how um, like a lot of people want to be having these kinds of conversations, especially because they go into deep issues that affect so many people, they affect everyone, and they just don't want to talk about it because they don't want to ruffle the feathers, you know, they don't want to talk about it because it's, it's like, too political or like too too much conflict and like we become people that just just want to avoid conflict at all costs but if we want to make changes and if we want to like make an impact we're we have to ruffle the feathers you know like we have to do the work and we can't be afraid we can't be afraid of emotions we can't be afraid of people getting mad at us you know like I was just arguing with my sister the other day and I was like, oh my gosh, please don't get mad at me. And they were like, I'm allowed to be mad. And I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I was like, it made me so much less afraid of people being mad at me. And I, I, I was like really shocked in that moment um, when, they, when they said that to me, um, but it helped me overcome a lot of fear. Um, I think also, you know, um, for me, I'm like the kind of person who will pick a project and then go hard on that project, like to the point of exhaustion. And for me, it's been a lot of learning about rest as resistance as well. You know, like making sure that I'm physically and mentally healthy so that I can actually bring my best to the table. And I think that's a really important thing too, because when we're not at the, when we're not able to be at our best, they're also winning. Like the the oppressor is also winning, and you know, 
just stay connected with with your mind and your spirit and your body and you'll remain connected to everyone else you know this connection is is working in servitude of capitalism and of the system yeah i i also would like to add thank you so much all of you for your answers it was so nice but um i want to add also that it's about understanding that activism um can be uh, taken from many different angles like everyone is needed in this fight is like from the people that go to the courtrooms to the artists who create posters everyone um and it and it's normal to be scared i think we all experience it that some days we're like okay yes today i'm i feel so empowered i really want to do this i wanna you know um but then other days it's just too much. It's too overwhelming and it's exhausting. And that's okay. It's super normal that we feel all of these things. It's also, we are so bombarded with all of this information all the time on every platform that we go on. Um, everywhere we go, like people will talk about these things or maybe very topically, but they will be mentioned or we'll be aware of them. So I think it's hard to um, not think about this and the moment we start facing these feelings and stop running from them, I think we can take them and create something with this. So I think it's it's really important to to yeah accept that we can be mad, others can get mad. We all have the right to do this. So yeah. Thank you, yeah, for your answer. I really connect with you on the fact that yeah, like I wake up and I think about the planet and the people and I go to bed and I think about that as well. And it's hard sometimes to like disconnect a bit from that, but it is also important first to acknowledge that those emotions, uh, anger or anxiety are normal. It just like shows you care because the situation is not that happy, but also that um, you are allowed to rest and to value times of like non-monetized activities of spirituality and it really helps I think to um, like take a bit of distance to go back to actions and sharing with others and yeah remembering that you are not alone in that and yeah we will maybe mention that again but I wanted to dig in and take some questions um first there were uh, dan helmer i think i don't think he, i don't know if you wanted to open your microphone or if you were introducing yourself but he said that uh, it connects more oh yeah if you want to open your microphone you can i mean yeah sure it probably is easier to get context on what i was saying so conflict as going on what um what krista was saying so conflict isn't isn't bad. Um, I think one of the things that we conflict and and I think conflict is I think there's a, there's something that needs to be separated between conflict and violence, um, because because that's one of the things that that when we when especially in in the English language of, of hearing context conflict right we're oh don't want to have conflict, but the reality is conflict is all the time. So it's it's in the the food the we. we uh, we eat, right? It's the water. It's it also is, is simply as, as spending time with a friend, right? So like where you have two friends, right? And probably everyone has has had this where like, right, I want to spend time with, with like my one friend and like I want to spend a day and then that person the other person want another person, another friend wants to spend the same same day. You're like, well you could you could the two friends can fight it out and, and kill each other. Or they can say like, well, actually, why don't we all three just hang out? Or like, how about I spend half the day he, like with with the one friend, and then then you spend the other half, right? There, this is conflict, and conflict isn't bad. It's it's time, it's 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 resources, it's, it's many things, and so it's it's just that that simple, and so so that's really what we have to define like this conflict, and so like being and so especially the thing too is that um, yeah, and and that feelings we're emotional beings too, and that's that's like where expressing our emotions are the most important thing and, and we express those because I, I know I've definitely have been conflict adverse and, and uh or or like emotion sharing adverse especially like depending on on how we right I think you know how we've institutionalized and uh our like feel, feelings from like right you can talk about um gender gender um norms of like of 
men and women of how much they, they're taught in terms of being recognizing emotions but like these things as we like are able to express those like that's it, it's even more and it's like it's okay to be mad like you know like when you're when siblings fight it's like oh yeah well, we still love each other but then we're just trying to get to understand each other and that's where i think the basis of it is like is having that that um having that having recognizing that conflict isn't bad and it's, it's actually like every moment of our life like i gotta go to the bathroom but i want to talk to you but i gotta go to the bathroom but i want to talk to you that's a conflict right now <laughs> um and so when we when we look at it that way it's like it's it's more of of getting used to that and that's really important i think is that like no like actually i love who i am and i'm just gonna gonna share it with you that's something that's pretty important um especially because like sometimes when we don't say it there's a john mayer song called say say what you need to say um and uh and so that's like that's where i think is important like we, we start to just share with each other yeah definitely thank you dan and i feel that also conflict is sometimes a bit necessary as we want like our fights to just go into conflict with like those current systems and as the system is a bit within all of us they can't it can't always be a void so thank you um, thank you very much and now i have a question for from laika thank you laika for joining from south africa uh, to Krista, with a background in fashion, what is your take on the gentrification of thrifting? What opinions do you have on it and how do you think we can overcome it, if we can? Uh, yeah, the gentrification of thrifting. Well, I mean, I have like, it's tough for me because I'm like, I, I want, I want more people to buy secondhand, right? I think that makes sense. It's something that needs to be done. Like we, like if we stopped making clothes in the world right now, like we would have enough clothes for a long time. You know, the fashion industry makes, produces 150 billion garments a year. There's only like 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. And that number does not compound on itself. You know, it's not like we're getting 7.7 .7 billion people added to the world every year, which maybe at some point you would art make, I was like, somebody would justify that as like why we need so many clothes. We don't need any more clothes, you know? And so like, I want people, you know, in my mind, I want people to to thrift more and to buy more secondhand. But then, you know, I think um, like this idea of shopping secondhand also kind of like lends an excuse to the people who want to like just buy their clothes and then donate them because they think it's going to go to the right place. You know, there's so much lack of transparency in terms of where our clothes go after we donate them. And it's a huge problem in terms of global waste and emissions that are being put out. And most of those emissions, even though most of the clothing is coming from um, high GDP countries, most of the emissions are happening in low GDP countries. And, you know, I, I will say that like, um, you know, there are certain markets like in, in West Africa, in Accra, where they, they want a certain amount of secondhand right? They don't want waste. They don't want garbage. They don't want your stuff that has holes, stains, st stuff like that. But they do want like decent quality clothes because they have a huge secondhand market. You know, um, there's a fashion educator who is amazing. Her name's Liz Ricketts. Um, I can put her name in the chat um, or her Instagram handle, but she does so much work in West Africa. And, you know, she talks about how people have been using her foundation's research to advocate for a ban on secondhand clothing going to West, West Africa, which is not even what they want. And they've never said that they wanted that. And so this kind of goes back to like a lot of things we've been talking about today, where it's like, we need the bottoms, bottom up solutions. We need to talk to the actual communities that would be affected. Um, I don't know that we can solve this idea of the gentrification of thrift. I think like once gentrifiers have their hold on something, like, you know, they're the ones who have a lot of money and a lot of power. And the best thing we can do is keep speaking about it and talk about like what's wrong with it. 
Um, and I get that that's kind of where I'm at right now. I mean, um, I think the gentrification part of it is also like, it's, it's not always the intention of some of the people who are doing it. Um, you know, so I think that's a tough thing too, because I think if people like for me, if I'm like, I want people to buy more secondhand, then maybe I'm starting to share, like I'm only buying secondhand now, but then it creates this demand for thrift or for vintage or worn in sweatshirts because now that's the cool thing. And like, how do I control that? I'm not really sure. Um, and so I think the best thing we can do is like try to understand the intentions behind like what people might be doing if they're pushing for secondhand. Um, because I think that's probably where you'll find the separation of like who's actually gentrifying and who's not. Yeah, I think practicing system thinking and connecting the dots in the system is definitely not the solution, but like a tool towards it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, we have a question from Andrea in Costa Rica. Uh, so her question would be, how can we include empathy in the tools we use, like system thinking, for example, to create awareness about certain topics while creating links between humanity and sustainability without it being overwhelming? So I don't know. Yeah, I'm happy for anyone to comment on that. Can you repeat it? Which is it in the comments? Yes, it's yes, it is. It's the question of Andrea in Costa Rica. Oh, um, I think uh, including empathy is definitely crucial from like a younger age. I mean, you can definitely teach. I think uh, kids are like more easier to like. It's easier for kids to be like, oh man, like I understand like that that would make me upset, and like adults I feel like are a little bit more like molded in like their ways. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, when I'm talking to people one on one, obviously it depends very much like who I'm speaking to and my relationship to them. But um, often I will like just point blank ask people like what would you do if you were in this situation and like think about it and like how would you expect other people to react should they be in that situation and when you know they kind of start scrambling and be like well I don't know I'd be like well then why do you expect other people to and just kind of like um I think for me trying to get people to understand when I'm talking to like a larger group of people that the solutions that we're looking for when it comes to like displacement and stuff like that are not always like straightforward um and really trying to get them to un like understand it's not you today, but it could be you tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, I think always just trying to figure out like knowing who you're talking to, whether it be an audience or a singular person, but being able to figure out like, how can I relate this back to them is how I kind of go about trying to inject empathy and like how we use empathy um, to talk to other people. Yeah, I also think that um, it's very interesting that Andrea mentioned systems thinking because that is how we can really see how interconnected and interdependent so many things are. And we stop looking at things individually, but we see them as a part of this bigger whole. So um, I think teaching from empathy has to come from a place where we understand the interconnectedness that exists within different topics and within a community. So yeah, the thing with systems thinking is that you take one word and suddenly you have all of this uh, things uh, related to it. Like for example, with sustainability, you can talk about so many things. So the, <laughs> the part that I think is hard to understand is like, uh, sorry to respond is like, how can it uh, be done without it being overwhelming? I think that's that's a tricky part of it because um, in order for it not to be overwhelming, I think it has to be a very uh, well thought and slow process to slowly integrate it like Ariel was saying uh, from very young age because it's we're like sponges when we're little, we absorb everything we're taught. 
So if we are taught um, to develop more our emotional intelligence and to look at things from a more empathetic uh, perspective, it can help us as we grow up um, to encounter the situations and react differently than normally, um, like what would normally would. But I think it's it takes time because it is a process that has to be tackled from many different places and by different actors. Um, so yeah, I think without it being overwhelming, it's 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 gonna be complicated. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Marian. But I think that it really helps, as you were saying, Ariel, that um, like to imagine yourself in the place of others. Because I was seeing something on Instagram the other day that was saying that uh, some people are saying that, yeah, you know, it's not that much of a difficult place to be in a such position or so. But when you ask them, yeah, so do you want to, would you want to take their place? They're like, yeah, like, do you want to be a black woman living in like a difficult part of a such city? And yeah, they will never take her place because they know in themselves that it is more complicated that in their position. And also, I really like that you mentioned that like it could be you the next day because it's a system that is based on oppression. So who is who is telling you that you are not going to be there in a few years or so? So yeah, thank you. And we have a question from Katija, and I think I'm going to go to Miti for this one because she's asking, um, so she's from the Philippines and she is asking, how can we create and or connect to groups and like-minded communities with the same vision, especially in a, in a country like the Philippines? Uh, now with the pandemic, our virtual platforms are being used more. How can we make use of online platforms to spread awareness? So yeah, please, the floor is yours. I guess it's really about starting somewhere. So talking to these like-minded people or groups, you can brainstorm and try to think of what you can do. Um, and especially now with everything online, it's so hard because you're also kind of competing with everything being online and and especially in countries like the Philippines where there's so many issues happening every single day it's hard to get people's attention sometimes so we like to be really really creative in our content um in the start of the pandemic we made a tiktok song and a tiktok dance about the climate because it's what's effective so just really don't be afraid to have fun when you're creating this content and when you're using your online platform to spread awareness because the climate crisis is already such a heavy issue. We don't have to like approach it and explain it in such a heavy way every single time also. It's important to talk about the urgency and how difficult everything is, of course, but you don't always have to be doom and gloom when talking about the climate crisis. We are saying that there is a better world possible, that we are unstoppable. So show that better world, show that creative side. Um, because then, you know, memes are such a great way to communicate. Um, I, I think Ariel probably could say more about this because of the online platform thing, but really just, just have fun because, you know, that's, everything you do, also your advocacy work, it, you should be enjoying it. If you're not enjoying it as much anymore, then you should take a rest and take a step back because then something is wrong and you're not doing it from the right place anymore. And you don't want to burn yourself out also. As Krista said, rest is resistance. So it's so important that you take care of your mental health also. Can I add to that? I, I just feel like I love that you brought up like making like having fun with it because like I don't know like when I think about the earth or like sustainability like why I care about the earth it's because it's so like like it leaves me in awe right like every time I'm in nature or every time like I'm outside or like at the beach or whatever like I'm just like the world is crazy like the planet is crazy earth is amazing mother nature is amazing and like we're we we spend so much time focusing on negative language that of course like so many people don't want to participate in it because 
people don't like feeling like that. You know, like we, we talked about climate anxiety, right? And like, it's a, it's a hard thing to deal with. And a lot of people don't have the emotional intelligence to deal with it. And so when we, when we, you know, not that we shouldn't talk about it, but when we also incorporate a different aspect and a different perspective, that's, it's more attainable and like lowers the barrier for entry. It, it opens the door to, to like more people participating and engaging in really good conversation. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so important to remember why, why we are doing all that, which is that, yeah, we are having fun with the people we like and we are having fun like in the nature and everything. And it's so important because if you are not doing this for that, like you can't have a strong reason, well, strong enough reasons. And as Mitzi was saying earlier, uh, that her love is stronger than her fear. And I think it's, this is all about that. Um, so yeah, thank you. Ariel, do you want to say a word about uh, uh, like online platforms? And I know you have been talking also as like, uh, the difficulties of algorithms <laughs> online. Uh, so yeah, if you want to say a word on that and uh, we can take a last question if someone wants that, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, so yeah, what Missy said, memes are super, super useful. One thing that I realized though was that like, they're really useful for grabbing attention, but definitely not useful for like understanding nuances. So I started making a lot of memes on my page to kind of introduce people to different environmental issues. And then I'll share like an article afterwards. So um, like yesterday I shared a, me a meme I made about mangroves. And then after the meme for the remaining slides, I put like, um, information as to like why mangroves are so important to begin with. Um, this is something I do with like a lot of different topics that I know people are probably like, what, like, what does it matter? You know, things that aren't necessarily like always the most interesting. I think it's really useful to make memes, get people laughing and then be like, okay, now this is why this is a problem. Um, I usually actually get pretty decent engagement on them and people will share them. So I think it just further highlights like the need for education to be fun and accessible. Um, because yeah, people definitely like engage when given the opportunity. And if anyone has any questions about that and a final question about that, I'd be happy to answer. And if not, no worries. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we will be able to like go on to the conclusion of our discussions. And I just wanted to end on a, a kind of a hope tour to end on a even more positive note. <laughs> um, I wanted you girls to share one thing that gives you hope. Um, it can be like very specific or more general. So yeah, I I'm, I'm, would be happy and curious to hear you on that. Yeah, I think for me, it's mostly people that uh, I connect with that give me hope because that's, I think, yeah, as humans, we really want to have this feeling of belonging to a group, to a community. Um, I think we all have experienced this, this wanting to, to not feel alone. So I think in, in regarding to climate justice and social justice, it's so applicable as well because we want to know that we are not alone in the fight. Um, and although we might know it somehow, it's nice to share these experiences with people to know for a fact that we are not alone and that we, yeah, we can count on so many people and we can do so many um, things from our own, uh, yeah, like in our own ways. And that it, it's, it's still going to be really helpful that we each put a, a bit of effort. But yeah, I think for me, it's mostly this, um, this idea of like knowing that I'm not alone in this. And then there's so many of us, like Mitzi said, like in every continent, every country, we would like to think that <laughs> everywhere. So yeah, I think for me, it's, it's mostly that 
knowing that there's so many of us out there that really want to to make a change and yeah i think for me um hope also similarly comes from my like not just my following but like seeing how much um the environmental space has grown like in the past few years so when i started again it was 2018 um, and I didn't have any like connections, any background environmentals or anything like that. I wasn't sure people were going to be interested, but now seeing so many people who have also come from different backgrounds and recognizing like that this is something that deserves, you know, their full time attention to me gives me a lot of hope also because it's like, oh, okay, it wasn't just me, you know, and also um, I think a big thing that gives me hope is um, something I always see on my page is like individuals collectively make change. So I vehemently disagree with people who are like, oh, it, you know, corporations like take all the burden of responsibility and individuals don't. I think individuals have a huge role to play. And I try to tell people like individual doesn't mean solitary. So it doesn't mean that I expect like one person to change the world, but I do expect every individual to collectively be able to make decisions to make this like world a little bit of a better place. Um, and like, you know, um, I often tell people like, if I didn't start caring about this individually, like I wouldn't start caring about it, you know, on the clock, um, so to speak. So like I was, um, I'm gonna, I'm about to like switch jobs, but the job that I'm leaving, um, they had packaging that like wasn't the most sustainable and I was able to get it on the company's radar. Like, Hey, maybe we should start looking at more sustainable packaging because blah, 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 you know? And um, I know that if me as an individual had no interest in it, I would not have thought to bring that to the table professionally, but because as an individual, like I had those concerns, I was able to bring that and like, granted it was like a small company, but like individuals are like making choices on behalf of companies. And currently like the culture is, is like profit over people. But if, you know, individuals collectively start changing their mind, you know, that those choices will happen. And I don't think it's the responsibility of any one person, but I think everybody does bear some responsibility. Yeah, definitely. I think like, individual level is important as well because it also helps to have a sense of um, coherence between like your uh, life, personal life, professional life uh, and what you are fighting for. So yeah, definitely it helps to start somewhere as you were all saying. Uh, Krista, do you want to go next? Sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd say similarly, like, for me, it's always been about people. Um, people are my inspiration for everything. Um, I find that, like, every time I have a conversation with someone, I'm, I'm surprised at what I learn, um, you know, and I think that if, if we're really thinking about, like, all people being equal, then why wouldn't we think that we could learn something from anyone? Um, you know, like I remember, <laughs> I remember that I was like in line for a farmer's market one day and, you know, there's like so much weird feelings about like giving homeless people or people who are experiencing homelessness, giving them money because it's like, well, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to buy drugs? Are they like, what are, like, what are they going to do with it? And it's like, one, does it matter? <laughs> like, and t like they don't they don't have a place to live. They obviously don't have food around them. Like, they're they're obviously experiencing something experiencing something really really difficult. And I was like standing there, and I was like, I really want to like give this person something. And you know, I only had like a a couple of dollars of change, and so I was just like, I'm just gonna do it. And this man is wearing this shirt that says like um, a church for the poor should be a poor church. And I was like kind of floored by it because, you know, like churches who bring it, I, I was just thinking about like, you know, how churches bring in so much money from so many people, but then you like here in LA, I see churches bringing in money all the time, but then they're throwing extravagant parties or they're wearing leather jackets or buying motorcycles or 
wearing Gucci shoes or whatever. And I'm like, okay, but like, did we do any work here? Like what, like what, what is the work that we're actually doing here? And so I think like, when I just think about um, engaging with other people, like that, that is what really does it for me. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think that I like, I like to think of like communities like this as us just being like one collective brain, you know, like I don't have as an individual, I don't have the full capacity to know all of these things under the umbrella of sustainability. But what I don't know, like Marie knows what, or Mitzi knows, or Ariel knows. And like, we need to lean on each other in that way. So yeah, that's kind of like, that's, that's what, what does it for me. Yeah, thank you so much. This is like generation long work, but it is important to know that we are not alone, like be them the like explicit, the people that are doing that explicitly, like as activists or in their lives talking about that, like we are, but also so many people are just like living sustainably and are sometimes not recognized. Like I saw the other day that um, indigenous people are making up for 5% of the world population, but are protecting like 80% of the, the ecosystems. And even though the people that, that are not saying it out loud are fighting for that in their lives. So we are definitely not alone. So yeah, um, Mitzi, do you want to close that hope tour? I think I already talked about it earlier, um, but really it's that knowing that we aren't alone, knowing that oppressors have always lost. It may take a very long time, which it usually does, but it does happen eventually. Um, so this is again, just the latest wave of revolutions and we're just, biding our time of course there is also that aspect of do we have enough time but you know we can do it um years ago two degrees celsius was seen as radical and not and super difficult to get to and now that is our limit and then we're just going to keep pushing that lower to 1.5 and we're going to stick to the 1.5 degrees celsius limit so people's power works it it, it there is so much truth in what people are saying and there is so much energy and power across the world. And we are all always constantly learning and growing and that's the most important part. And I think that's what gives me hope. The fact that the climate movement really, the youth climate movement really did start as this very white Eurocentric movement. And now we're seeing intersectionality being talked about more. Now we're seeing um, the diverse voices and the most marginalized voices being amplified more and that is what gives me hope because we're so willing to learn and grow and adapt. And that's what makes us different from the people in power because we know how to change. We know how to make things better for ourselves. And that is why we will win. Yeah, I feel hope is so much about action and about sharing and caring. So yeah, thank you. These are all great words to close on and I think a wonderful call to action as well. So thank you so much for the four of you for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you to the audience that turned up today and those who will connect after uh, on the recording. Um, so this was my first experience as a moderator and I feel so honored uh, for having, uh, having been able to share it with you. So yeah. I wish you all a great rest of the day or a great evening or a great night for some of us. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. <laughs>